there's been a little bit of calamity uh, with uh, um, uh, with my hard drive. It's um, uh, doing some. Um, it's having an identity crisis, actually. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. But I think that gives me this great opportunity to have uh, this a little bit more interactive. You all know what PowerPoint uh, slides uh, look like. Some of you may come to conferences and get the, the uh, mental, emotional con condition of the 21st century called PowerPoint glaze, where your eyes glaze over and you end up feeling like a glazed donut at the end of a, a session. So I'm going to make this more interactive, and I don't mind that at all. So uh, we're, while we were um, doing a vasectomy on my uh, uh, little laptop computer over there, that's all behind us now, and we're just going to have fun with, uh, with what we're doing. Um, I want to start out with a, with a, a blessing prayer um, to you, because I, I think when we talk about uh, using food to connect us, we're, we're not just talking about a, a head exercise. We're talking about a heart and mind exercise that's part of uh, the theme of this conference. And so it comes back to what values we want to see embedded in our food system. And, and so um, uh, bear with me while I read this to you. It's up there, but I think sharing it as an oral piece is, is worthwhile. And now let me see if I can make this move or or am I just messing up computers everywhere today? Where is, how is that not moving? There we go. There we go. This is, is um, called a terroirist, not a terrorist manifesto. So uh, again, don't, don't tell Homeland Security on me. Know where your food comes from through knowing those who produced it for you, from farmer to forager, rancher to fisher to earthworms building a deeper, richer soil, to the heirloom vegetable, the nitrogen-fixing legume, the pollinator, the heritage breed of livestock, the sourdough culture rising in your flower. Know where your food comes from by the very way that it tastes, its freshness telling you how far it may have traveled, the hint of mint in the cheese, reminding you what the goat has eaten, the terroir of the wine, reminding you of the lime in the very stone that you stand upon, so that you can stand up for the land that has given it to you. Know where your food has come from by ascertaining the health and wealth of those who picked and processed it. By the fertility of the soil, that is left in the patch where it once grew by the traces of pesticides or lack of them found in the birds and the bees there. Know whether the bays and shoals where your shrimp and fish once ran were left richer or poorer than before you and your kin ate from them. Know where your food comes from by the richness of stories told around the table recalling all that was harvested nearby during the years it came before you, when your predecessors and your ancestors roamed the same woods and neighborhoods where you and yours now roam. Know them by the song sung to praise them, by the handmade tools kept to harvest them, by the rites and the feasts held to celebrate them, by the laughter let loose to show them our affection. Oops. Know where your food comes from by the patience displayed while putting them up, while peeling, skinning, coring, or gutting them, while pit roasting, poaching, or fermenting them, while canning, salting, or smoking them, while arranging them on the plate for our eyes to behold. Know where your food comes from by the slow, savoring of each and every morsel by letting their fragrances lodge in your memory, reminding you of just exactly where you were the very day that you first became blessed by their distinctive flavors. 
Now, when you know where your food comes from, you can give something back to those lands and those waters. That rural culture, that migrant harvester, curer, smoker, poacher, roaster, or vintner. You can give something back to that soil, something fecund and fleeting like compost, or something lasting and legal like protection. We as humans have not been given roots as obvious as those of plants. So the surest way that we have to lodge ourselves within this blessed earth is by knowing where our food has come from. I, I like to start there because it reminds us of all the deep connections, not just with the other humans that bring us our daily bread, but with the plants and animals, the biodiversity, if you will, in the soil, in the set of bees and, and butterflies and thrips that pollinate our crops, by the watersheds above us, that when we're talking about food systems, we're talking both about our human and non-human neighbors and the way in that how we eat, what we choose to eat, where we choose to get it from, whether it's local or uh, far away, can either harm or heal just by how we make our food choices. We can make the world better or we can continue to deplete the world by how we choose to eat. Each of you has this incredible power in changing the world every time you sit down to eat something. Monsanto does not have control over you. Cargill does not have control over you. You have the power to drive them out of a market and create new markets that, it, that are consistent with your values that could ultimately marginalize them, or you have the power or abdicate the power to let business as usual in, in agribusiness um, control how the world works. And I'm gonna say a, a statement that I think is um, outrageously uh, general, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying it as a hyperbole, largely for discussion purposes to try to, try to tweak us all at 10.30 in the morning. But I would claim that there has never been a food system explicitly designed to simultaneously work for the health of the land, the health of the farm workers and farmers who work the land, and for the so-called consumers, and, and in particularly, I'm most concerned about the health of our children and the health of our elders. That we accept every day this ad hoc food system that's a mix of local and global, that may have good food in parts of it, but the food system as a whole has been designed um, by default by um, the interests of certain corporations and government agencies, the government agencies who feel they're protecting us from bad food, and not by the values and the skills and the talents in a room like this. And I would say that rather than blaming Monsanto or Cargill or the American Farm Bureau for the deficiencies of that current food system, we have to take responsibility for making it right. And our education systems have to take responsibility for the fact that we've never trained any of us here, maybe Molly's the exception, I don't know, to be to think of ourselves as designers of food systems, co-designers of food systems, that however we may learn about agriculture, sustainable agriculture, or culinary arts, or managing farmers markets, 
it's, it's never been done with the whole food system in mind. Our education system has not trained us either in the content or the processes that would um, necessarily allow each of you to think of yourselves as co-designers of a healthy, more robust, and resilient food system. So there's great sustainable ag programs in two dozen colleges across the country and great underpinnings of that going all the way back to the start of COA. There's great culinary arts programs and uh, things like what's going on in New Hampshire, you know, uh, in, in um, uh, dialogue uh, with uh, Slow Food University where I've taught in Italy, the, the university that Carlo Petrini uh, set up. But I, but I would say that even with the best curriculum, we've never fully taken head on that, that our, our goal should not just be to train farmers or food activists or, or urban food justice advocates, but co-designers of a more just, resilient, and sustainable food system. We don't think of it that way. There's more work being done in architecture schools on participatory design of buildings than there is in agricultural land-grant colleges on participatory design of food systems. We don't think as a food system as a designable entity almost. I mean, that's, that's the trouble. So, so the irony with that is that by minimum estimates, 20% of our carbon footprint of Americans has to do with the production and, and transport of food from the farm gate to the farmer's market or grocery store. That's one in five um, uh, calories that we expend just by the economics of energy uh, is related to the on-farm energy use of food production, pumping water, producing nitrogen fertilizer, and the, the farm gate to uh, farmer's market or store um, transport of that food. Okay, think about that then. That's, that's one in five calories that is involved in our carbon fo footprint. But think about what that estimate might be if, if we look at all the embedded energy and water and materials in the buildings where we store food, the vehicles that we move food with, the processing that goes on of food once it leaves the store and comes into our households. Um, my guess and, and uh, uh, groups like Redefining Progress say that our, our carbon footprint for Americans is probably 40% our carbon food print Okay, that, that's basically saying two-fifths, not one-fifth of our whole impact on the earth is somehow embedded in our food system. And yet even in things like the, International, or the Institute for Global Sustainability at Arizona State University where we have this marvelous uh, uh, university president who says we're gonna make this the biggest sustainability university in the world. I, I've never got quite that connection between big and sustainability, but aside from that, uh, like sustainability is a growth industry, it's kind of a paradox to me. Um, the, the strange thing is that there's not even one in 20 people on his staff that are looking at the sustainability issues in food systems because they're thinking of, well, the way to, to, to solve the, uh, the issues relating to the energy crisis and climate change and our ecological footprint is to work on transportation, to work on greener buildings, to work on greener uh, uh, methods of, of bringing other materials into urban uh, strata. I would argue that the biggest thing that we can do to mitigate and adapt to climate change is through the food connection that the thing that we could 
most quickly do to transition the American economy to a green economy is through the kind of entrepreneurial spirit that we see in, in food micro enterprises uh, where, where people are, are wanting to have green energy and, and, and green uh, ac uh, accession of materials to go with their, their, their farming operations. And the, the, the thing that we could most contribute to making America sustainable, if we can even ever get there, would be to use the food system as the first foot down in, in moving everything else along. And yet you don't see that um, reflected in the sustainability institutes of our governments or major universities. Why am I, why am I emphasizing that? Because um, the people in sustainable architecture and in, in educational programs do get that we can't do architecture as we did 40, 50 years ago, where if you got out of architecture school, you're supposed to do, uh, go out and build great monuments to your reputation. You know, big honking slabs of concrete and metal um, that, that uh, reflected your power in the world or whatever. But now those same schools of architecture and design are totally in to a democratic participatory design process. If you go to Rhode Island School of Design, um, it, it isn't about um, um, mimicking European trends in uh, curvilinear furniture anymore or something like that. It's about learning the participatory design process where you all become co-designers of, of something new and amazing like uh, light bulbs run on bioluminescence that they assume that the way they will do design in the future is by bringing scientists, engineers, artists together for a creative process that thinks out of the box to design new things. And some of the most interesting work in redesigning food systems is actually coming from people coming out of art schools and interior design schools. Um, uh, Brett O'Reilly with the uh, Window Farms uh, project that now has something on the order of 5,000 people designing from completely recycled materials, um, vertical um, uh, hydroponic systems um, using um, uh, nutrient slurries that are all completely from recycled materials. The bottles that they assemble these things from are all from recycled materials assembled by handicapped adults um, in places where those people really need uh, satisfying work. And over 300,000 people are tweaking these systems and evaluating them in about 20 countries now. This, <laughs> this whole thing came out of three kids in a design school together, not people from an ag school or sustainable ag program. They're saying, how can we involve people in redesigning food systems, whether they're the food production systems or the transport systems or the preparation processing and, and waste um, uh, uh, revaluing systems, uh, repurposing systems, um, using participatory design to do that, that I won't have the answers to how to make those systems work by myself. Molly might not, Todd might not, Suzanne might not. But if we involve all of you in participatory design, and some of you know so, something about soil sludge and sl slurries, and someone else knows something about recycling, and someone else knows something about uh, solar pumps, we can begin to uh, build a food system that, that's greater than the sum of the parts. So I don't think we're teaching students at most liberal arts colleges, so there's a better shot at that, uh, of, of that kind of uh, cross-disciplinary teaching in liberal arts colleges, and certainly not in our ag colleges, to look at food systems that way. Even Wes Jackson, one of my heroes uh, growing up, um, is redesigning an agricultural system to perennialize it, but he doesn't go there in terms of the overall food system. So 
if he produces a perennial grain, as now I've eaten some of his, his, his stuff and made pancakes out of it, and it's okay. But will it go into a food system that is just as flawed as the ones that annual grain goes into? So he's worked on redesigning the food production system, but that's just one small part of the entire system. So let me talk about this participatory design and, and what I think our educational institutions need to um, repurpose themselves with food as a metaphor, galvanizing um, issue, and um, um, I think whole body, whole senses, whole mind um, uh, engagement uh, with food as a way that we move our institutions along to something that they haven't been before. First of all, we need to train people equally in process and content. That if you go to an ag school, um, it's almost embarrassing to talk about values in a class. It's like, you know, so I, I, I farm about 16, 20 acres, um, uh, four of that an orchard on my own land, and then uh, we're going from about 12 acres to about 16 acres uh, with heritage grains like what Amber Lemke and other people are doing in Maine with the Somerset Mill. Uh, and, um, and so I'm, I'm around a lot of farmers and ranchers, and I co-farm with a rancher. And to talk about the economics of what we're doing, even though we're both putting in money weekly to, to get this heritage grain uh, co-op off the ground, it's, it's almost as embarrassing for him to talk about the economic viability of farming and ranching at this point in time as it would for me to ask him about his sex life. Farmers just don't go there. They don't talk about whether they're making any money or losing money, because most of them are losing money, any more than a, a religious conservative would ever you know, talk about something about their, their, um, their intimate life. It's like off the, off the topic line. Where I'm pointing that out is that, that f farmers, our ag schools train people to be farmers and ranchers with a content-oriented curriculum that has very little to do with the kind of values we're talking about this weekend, or virtually nothing about democratic process. A third of the people graduating from ag schools today may become extension agents, do international development work, or whatever, and yet to talk about things like the design process, the democratic process, um, the political ecology of food, the, the pressures from the outside that impinge on any local food system so that even though you may be producing maple syrup in, in uh, Maine or Vermont, the whole context of maple syrup is still shaped by everything that's happening with any sugar product in the whole world. You know, Vermont is not an island. We never get to that stuff. The, the content is defined as technical content. You don't go to values. You don't go to democratic process. So I think we need to begin to train people who are as comfortable in learning new content, biochar and how you do integrated into soils or uh, uh, effective microbes and what they do in soils or, or water harvesting. That's a key issue where I live because uh, we have less water than you guys have warm days, you know. The, we, the, the, the point is that, that there is content stuff that we have to master, but just as important is to talk about the values and to talk about the process of, of participatory design to change our food systems, not only why we need to do it, but, but there's, no, there's no heroes anymore. The hero if there's a hero in food systems, is the community, not individuals. We don't need another Wendell Berry, uh, West Jackson, Fukuoka, Bill McKibben. We need communities, not individual heroes. 
We don't need another Francis Moore LaPay like we needed her 30 years ago. We need everyone in a community to step up to the plate. The chances are that those of you who are students here, probably one to two percent of you will ever become farmers. And yet most sustainable ag programs at, at experimental college and liberal arts colleges, if they touch on these topics, it's through an, a sustainable ag program that sort of assumes you're training farmers. If more than 1% comes out of a school like this, that's great. It could be that this next decade it'll be 10% of the students engage in farming or orchard keeping or aquaculture or, or community gardens in some way or the other. But, but what I'm getting at isn't that I'm putting down training people to be farmers, but there's about 10,000 other niches in a food system that we need to train people for. We need to train people to be enlightened dumpster divers. We need to train people to be pie makers. We need to train people to deal with the 50% of American food production that ends up as waste. Read this book, American Wasteland, that, that, that Bloom just put out. 50% of everything that we plant in the ground either ends up as waste in the field, waste in the processing room, or waste in the back room of a grocery store even before it gets to our houses. So we could feed twice the people, number of people that are going hungry in America now just off the waste that is inherent in our food system now. And some communities have taken this on. It's a fine in some communities now to throw in compostable materials with other kinds of, of solid waste that you have to sort it out or you get fined. And, and even the, that serves not only as a disincentive for wasting that much stuff to begin with, but you're bringing it back into the soil. So what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here is uh, historically we've trained, you know, goofy crap like women get to go to the home economics departments. So that was the old land grant college model. And the guys get to go over and become um, uh, agronomists and learn how to plow the hell out of the soil. Okay, instead, what we need to be training is men and women as, as farmers, as farmers market managers, as policy wonks on how to, how to change our, our uh, state and, and county and federal policies about food and food waste and, and land stewardship. Um, techie geeks that are not just being trained in the computer science or, or uh, computerized design, but are being trained to, to help us use computer technologies to track the energy and material flows through food systems. We need to train uh, uh, people to be um, uh, uh, food hub managers, to aggregate food and distribute it equitably. We need to train people as food justice activists and even food justice mediators because not everyone in the food system sees what's happening there in the same way and some people are more disadvantaged uh, than others. We need to, to have food systems designed so that food justice is in mind. And let me bring up that topic because I live in an area that I live 12 miles north of uh, Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, which may seem pretty remote to you. You may never heard of Nogales. It's you know a couple thousand miles away from here. How does it affect your local food system? Why would you even care about what's going on in my neck of the woods? 60% of all the fresh produce eaten in the United States, in Maine, in this community comes through Nogales from November to April. That we have been outsourcing food just like we've been outsourcing the production of Ford uh, cars for, for, for uh, 50 to 100 years. So that virtually all the tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, and a dozen other things that are eaten in every school cafeteria in the United States, even in the communities that have gotten themselves up to 30% um, uh, local uh, uh, sourcing, 
this, the stuff that they're getting from the winter, even if they're getting beets and potatoes and arugula and stuff from hoop houses, part of what you're eating if you go into any conventional grocery store or restaurant in this state is coming through our little town. That system of bringing fresh produce up from northern Mexico, from frost-free areas, was started by a guy named Harriman about 140 years ago who, who got the first refrigerated cars going down in Mexico to bring stuff up um, uh, to be um, eaten in the United States at the time those products weren't available. So that even by 1930, 20% of all the fresh produce eaten in the United States went through this one little town in, on the Arizona-Mexico border where there's, there's uh, 50 uh, uh, food brokerage um, companies that have campuses larger than this campus. Um, the irony is that in the, these towns called Ambos Nogales, Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, and Nogales, Arizona, 38% of the kids suffer from outright hunger and 60% of the kids in, in the schools are food insecure. So here's this food superhighway going right in front of my farm. I mean, literally, the highway is within a quarter mile of my farm. And when, when illegal drugs aren't coming up that highway, the next truck is, is uh, all, this, all this produce. We're on a food superhighway with no exit ramp. What you choose to eat here affects the people in northern Mexico. Uh, a February 3rd freeze in 2011 put 15,000 farm workers uh, out of their jobs for four months because no one thought to turn on heaters in their hoop houses and greenhouses because they'd never had a freeze um, that bad since the time when greenhouses and hoop houses came into the area. 8% uh, of the of the total produce in the United States was lost within one week, and the prices of tomatoes here in Maine went up sevenfold within a week, and Denny's and you know conventional chain restaurants like that all across New England had on their menu, if you want tomatoes on your sandwich or in your salad, you'll either have to pay extra or know that uh, we, we can't even access them for the next six weeks. So a tremendous impact of one day of catastrophic weather affected the whole US, but it also affected the poorest of the poor. Farm workers in northern Mexico who work 10 hours a day in the field and then have to go to a food bank or food kitchen to get enough money, I mean, to get food for their family because what they're making as farm workers is not enough to buy food for their kids. So we have this irony that the people who bring us our daily bread are often going to food kitchens and, and uh, uh, soup kitchens and food pantries to feed their family, and they're the ones who are harvesting the food for us. That's an example of a pretty dysfunctional food system. It's so dysfunctional in Arizona right now that um, uh, that of about, um, I, I think it's something like that we produce $280 million of, of food that could be locally used that's being sent out of state and then bought back again for about 10 times that price and eaten in our schools. <clears throat> but at the same time, we have a $760 million um, uh, medical bill for diabetes and obesity in our state. So the, 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 uh, the cost, the medical cost of having people with poor diets is about two to three times uh, the production of food that could easily enter and be absorbed by the local market. That's the reason why we have to redesign our food systems, thinking that they're going to take us through the next 30 years as they are without massive medical costs because of all the the, the hidden problems embedded in them. Um, it, it's just not going to happen. If we, if we build in climate change where 
uh, uh, to this factor, uh, I mean to this scenario, that already 75% of the water reservoirs in the southwest are dry. Uh, with the drought the last couple years, we had um, uh, 500 counties de declared drought disaster areas in the southwest and midwest. If those kinds of things get aggravated, that whole system, however flawed and imperfect it is now, will simply collapse because there'll be no water for, for the Western Mexico vegetable production or for the stuff in the Southwest. So we have some real good incentives right in front of us to redesign these systems. What would a, a local food system or regional food system that functions, that's redesigned in a participatory way, look, smell, and taste like? That's my homework question for you. I, I literally want each of you to put on a piece of paper, and maybe we can put these on a wall. Give us one image, sensory image, of taste, fragrance, um, texture, appearance, of what a healthy food system that's good for the land, good for our kids, and good for our local economies would uh, taste, smell, or look like. The kinds of things that I see going on in our area, and I know there's parallel things going on in this area, we don't have much state or federal funding coming into Arizona and New Mexico to help us with this redesign. Most of it's coming from, from grassroots efforts like the ones that many of you are involved in. But let me just give you some statistics of what's happened the last 10 years since the so-called local food movement uh, really ramped up in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, the number of new producers, direct marketing, heritage foods, um, like the kind of beans that you have around here, or the kinds of uh, 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 heritage apples that uh, Todd was talking about. The number that are um, direct marketing those enlisted on localharvest.org, 58 new producers in Arizona, 35 in New Mexico. The number of new farmers markets, 72 in Arizona, 63 in uh, New Mexico. The number of new community supported agricultural projects, again, this is in 10 years. 29 in Arizona, 25 in New Mexico. The number of restaurants featuring local foods on their menus, 33 in Arizona, 43 in New Mexico. The number of urban farms and homesteads, this whole other part of the food system, it's not just a rural thing anymore, it's an urban thing too. 24 urban farms in Arizona, 15 in New Mexico. Forbes magazine says that one in every five servings of, of fruits and vegetables that we'll get by 2020 will be coming from urban production rather than rural production. So it's just as important that we, we work on urban food systems in part because it heals this terrible urban-rural divide that we've had where prior to the last 10, 15 years, only rural people were thinking about where our food comes from and urban people were enjoying it. Now it's that there's this dialectic happening between farmers on 400 acres and farmers on eight acres in a city. That kind of, of interaction is gonna keep America from drifting off and, and, um, and uh, devoluting into a thousand different kinds of tea parties. If we have urban and rural people engage with one another and seeing each other's needs and aspirations, I think it will do political healing, not just f food and health healing in this country. So the point I want to get across is that I'd like each of you to think of yourself and the rest of your life <laughs> as being engaged with your neighbors and people from different backgrounds. Walking across the aisle, if you're a Republican, being engaged with Democrats. If you're a religious conservative, being engaged uh, with people who can't even describe what their spiritual values are in a way that you understand that all of you together think of yourselves as co-designers of new food systems that explicitly aim for land health, human health, 
and economic health simultaneously. Americans have some very bizarre flaw compared to other people in the world where we have time holding multiple things in our head at the same time. Some of us are very good at looking at human health and every extra minute that we're not engaged in, in something we're thinking about, well, where are we gonna get the tofu tonight and where are we gonna, uh, how are we gonna uh, uh, pull the vegetables out of the hoop house or, or out of the um, uh, cold frame and how are we gonna combine that with something that a friend gave us. Other people are totally focused on land health. The point is, we have to learn to keep all of those three things in our heads and hearts together. What's gonna to happen to our kids if we fail at redesigning these food systems? What's gonna to happen to the land if we fail? And what's gonna to happen to the health of our rural and urban communities? So if I can say one last thing to you, go out tomorrow and think of yourselves as capable and powerful enough to change the food system in a positive way. Find other people who are willing to be engaged with you that, that may change your mind on how to do that. Ask this institution and every other educational institution to front load this issue as one of the key issues facing us for the next 50 to 100 years. And work to change our institutions, food systems, and our personal lives all at the same time. That's your homework task. Um, uh, 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 send me your results um, and, uh, and bless you for doing that work. Thank you so much. <laughs>